list of speakers. Did you actually, sorry, did we actually move, did you move that chair out because it's blocking the fire exit? We just had a discussion about it. That'd be great. Sorry, if you could move that chair as well and then move it. Yeah, thank you, sorry. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to Council tonight, September Council. Thank you very much. And we've got a busy agenda and we've got lots of people to, to talk, so uh, if you bear with us. Uh, we are being recorded tonight, so if anyone is making contributions, uh, please, if you could tell um, uh, Jim over on my left and um, uh, if you've got any problems with that. Um, it's also going live out on YouTube, and um, if there is a fire, uh, the uh, the stipulations are to move out the door you've come in, down the steps, and out onto the, the car park area over to my right, over to your left, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, anyway, thank you very much for your attendance tonight. Uh, what apologies do we have, Jackie? Uh, yes, sir. Apologies tonight from councillors Atkin, Elliot, Flitter, and McDonough. Uh, and Shirley and Rose. Uh, thank you. Right. Um, Public participation. One, two, three. We have six uh, speakers tonight, uh, all about assets of community value, and uh, each of you has three minutes each. And delighted to welcome back Eileen Ratcliffe, uh, Councillor Eileen Ratcliffe, and you're first up, Eileen. You know the form. It's uh, three minutes, please. To make a statement on the Meadows, uh, Summer Lane, Worksworth as an asset of community value. Eileen. Thank you, Chair. Twenty years ago this year, I had a site visit with the then planning manager. He knows who he is. He had applied to the government's Millennium Green Fund to purchase the meadows for the town. In fact, Derbyshire Dale had been encouraged to bid, and the meadows ticked all the boxes. However, it was not successful, as the owners wanted more than a meadow price. In 2017, I attended in this very room the Derbyshire Dales Inspector's Local Plan Inquiry to speak in support of land for new schools, infrastructure, housing, for the future quarry developments, all supporting them so that we had, um, uh, we were supporting the Derbyshire Dales in its inquiry the retention of the meadows as an open space. He, the county council, and many of the communities, and especially the Worksworth Neighbourhood Plan uh, members, and, uh, spoke in support of the local plan. And that wasn't easy. The Derbyshire Dales <coughs> policy on keeping the meadows as an open space a green lung around several housing estates and as close as you can get to our town and the other side of our valley. To view the meadows as low usage is not to understand this place or those that enjoy it. All ages sit on the benches enjoying the sunshine and play a place of rest and a meeting place outdoors. Tranquility a green lung, I repeat, on a congested town with congested, on congested roads through our town. The environment we live and enjoy so much is so important. It is a huge asset. Over 40 years, my sons played hide and seek, make believe hobbits, skateboarding, learning to ride a bike, and grew, as they got older, to paint and reflect on their growing up across the meadows. Walking through the meadows was part of dozens of many, including myself, walking on flat ground in rehabilitation following treatment. Linking residents and meeting points 
Our school children linger and enjoy the flora and fauna. Conservationists come at uh, Derbyshire Wildlife um, Surveys, looking at the insects and all the habitat. It was purchased as an open space for residents to enjoy. This meadow is now for sale. Hope <coughs> and the town council hopes to put in, has, has put in a bid to keep it for the community and we hope it's successful. If it isn't, three minutes. As we, thank you, Chair, I'll round up. We, as a community, are unable to buy it unless we have time to get pledges of money to approach the owner. The right to bid. The meadows really was not ever considered in this, in the way in which the residents now will be telling you tonight how much of an asset it is. I hope that everybody here. And those that are on uh, that can view this on video, that works with people have a great asset in mid meadows, and we join with the district council to try and fight to save it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Right. Uh, next up is Mr. Robert Lembry. Uh, Mr. Lembry, if you could stick to the three minutes, please. We've got lots of speakers. I want to be fair to everyone tonight, please. Mr. Lembry. <coughs> Reading that the Meadows had not got ACV status because it was there was nothing taking place that promoted social well-being and social interest, my jaw dropped. It felt like a computer says no moon. I wondered if anyone assessing <coughs> the merit of this bid has spoken to anyone who used the Meadows. As a sociologist, I acknowledge the term social well-being and social interests, and those are the criteria by which bids are assessed. I'm, uh, dogs are walked on the meadow. I'm not a dog owner, but I certainly enjoy talking to those who walk, wander about with their dogs or without. Conversation contributes to raising one's social well-being. Well-being is enhanced by the sighting of two benches to the north, used by all ages to, re to rest and talk at different times of day by older people stopping off with shopping before going home, some on a, to an empty house, by young people taking a break, chatting, by other group, whether it's groups who know each other or those who are meeting for the first time. Well-being is certainly enhanced by those sometimes recovering from a spell of illness, who use the paths on the meadows for short work or get back into the routine of exercising. Gives those taking as youngsters to school a breather, where the older child can run free for a short time. Kids being taken to school, playing, Play is well recognised as a, re a learning and socialising tool. Hence, contributes to personal well-being. Social interests are activities promoting social and personal well-being. Here, an example from the back, from the past: gorilla gardening, attempted tree planting. People concerned will know what I'm talking about. One criteria used to assess ACV requests: future use. But on this, we understand it wasn't actually applied in, in, for, uh, in, in, in terms of this bid. However, um, any personal wish list may hold, any personal wish list any individual may hold is not what we're looking for. However, if only the particular examples of use I've mentioned above are considered but extended to the next level, we would have a fact-based initial list of ways the meadow might be used in the future. I can only sketch over this. More seats with tidy grassed area for picnics, mini park. Wildlife, a natural garden area away from the park. <laughs> Planted with flowers to further promote birds and wildlife. Play and exercise, swings for the kids, near but safely away from traffic. An outdoor exercise area for adults, allotments. And then finally, the recent sales advert for the Meadows indicated sporting rights were in hand. For those whose tastes in sport is not currently catered for in Worksworth, only, only once digested, this nugget of information should open up new possibilities and extra ways to raise social interests and social well-being of more local community members. Who says there is no use of the meadows for further, furthering social well-being or social interests? It's already happening and it could easily be extended. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mrs. Allison Ledbury. 
Ready, please. Right, I'm, I'm planning to um, reiterate many of the things that have been said and I'm sure will be said by other people to back up what, what's gone before, really. Um, it's you, the Meadows is used, um, and I'm not quite sure how somebody could, you know, use the criteria of social well-being and not say that the, the Meadows is well used. Uh, used by all ages, older people, younger people, parents and children, dog workers, all these use the paths across the Meadows. We all know the, the importance of older people living on their own, getting out and talking to people. And this is, one of the, this is a group who use the Meadows, possibly not necessarily more than anybody else, but they are certainly uh, use, regular users of the Meadows. It provides the opportunity for people to walk slowly and safely instead of walking up the busy main road, to sit and talk to others who live alone and to other people who use the space. The SF asset is particularly vital to these older people who often rely on motorised scooters and walkers. And we've met people on the meadows and they probably haven't spoken to anybody else all day. Uh, families walk across the meadows and those with young children, it's important they can walk across freely to play, as has already been said, and that there is space to walk alongside a bush chair and hold a parent's hand. Young people, now young people use the area too. Sometimes they sit in the evening and chat till quite late. And uh, we have to think about works within spaces to meet and this is one of them that is used. Um, uh, it's, it's an area for wild, lots of wildlife, wrens, pheasants, herons, the herons have been seen there, and bats and wildflowers. And a neighbour and her son conducted their own survey one day. They were there doing a survey, mainly I understand, on the birds in the meadows. Uh, they decided that they would check on the number of people using, that, uh, using the meadows on one cold day in January. It was a Saturday at the end of January, and they clocked 150 people who used the meadows. And that was a cold winter's day. And I do know that, that in the summer, spring and summer and autumn, there's even more people on the meadows. So it's worth noting that. Um, future use, there'd be op the opportunity to expand and develop on the, the uses, on the um, groups of people who already use it, and to bring in some stuff, some cultural, recreational, sport uh, opportunities, uh, to further explore the wildlife and archaeological features, which is another feature of the meadows, of use for school students and interested adults, to develop activities that promote exercise and through that well-being, and um, possible gardening allotments for those in the town who don't have gardens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mrs. Sue Watts, next, please. Thank you. You have three minutes, like the others. Mrs. Watts. Okay. Thank you. You just press the, mach the machine. Thank you. In a world where we are constantly reminded about the imminent disasters that climate change will most definitely cause, we are bound to make a stand to save even this small plot of land known locally as the meadow. Wild flowers, wild meadows are already under threat and disappearing from our green and pleasant land. We should therefore be proactive in persevering, in preserving what already exists. This natural expanse of beauty and nature working in harmony reflects the changing seasons so vividly. A mat of cell and dyes covers the whole area in early spring and eventually delicate little patches of ladies' smock appear, rare and beautiful in this area. The white maid blossom, the blackthorn and the bluebells follow on and in late spring huge swathes of cow parsley and comfrey appear in, in the late spring, but by summer the rose bay willow herb and the dead nettle take over. And then we are left with the skeletons of umbellifers and giant thistle, which last into winter with the red berries of the hawthorn and the blackthorn. 
not to mention the wildlife species it supports, thousands of millions of insects and small creatures, newts, frogs, toads, including badgers, squirrels, although they are the grey ones, hedgehogs, and there's red kites have been seen overhead at buzzards and bats. If you think this seemingly insignificant parcel of land, <coughs> as suggested, is not an asset to the residents and visitors of this community, I invite you to, to spend time in this space and count the number of individuals who walk through it. Pass the time of day there, walk their dogs, stay and chat, or use it as a shortcut route on the level ground, particularly for elder pe elderly people. We have a right not to destroy this vital habitat, this jewel in the crown of such a town as Worksworth, a unique <coughs> wildlife haven so unusually close to the hustle and bustle of the town centre. If it's just the pound signs you can see, if it's just the pound signs you can see, get more land for building on, <coughs> then ask yourself, why must the love of money always dictate what we mm -hmm. what decisions we make? Three minutes. We love our meadow and we are passionate about it. Mm -hmm. And as the Chinese proverb says, the frog never drinks from the pond it lives in. Mm -hmm. Can't beat that one. Right, um, thank you very much. Um, right, some pond analogies, right. Uh, next up we have Ella McCarthy, please. You have three minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Just like everyone else, you've got three minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. The question that I asked the council is, can it be right that the council doesn't realise that the decision not to register the land in Worksworth, commonly known as the Meadows, as a community asset, flies in the face of views in the lo local community, and that furthermore it goes against views locally, nationally and globally about how we feel about protecting our green spaces for nature, the planet and the well-being of the people. The definition of an asset is that something has value and importance, while the Meadows has both of these. Often referred to as a green lung of Worksworth, the Meadows provides a peaceful and open space where people can just be. It could easily become a space for everyone. It is quite literally on many people's doorsteps, making it extremely accessible for young and old alike. Local organisations such as the Land Trust, Wildlife Trust, town council, community growers, scouting groups and schools could pull together with community members to show that this land is a loved and valuable space that is a true asset to our town. If given the opportunity, people would be able to use the meadows in a more organised fashion. For example, the wild space could be managed by keeping some of it for wildlife whilst having other areas for the use of families to rest and play. Trees could be planted, wild flower seeds scattered and raised beds built. <coughs> Not only can the meadows be a haven for, for people, but for nature too. In a time when we are faced with a global climate emergency, and when our own district council here has announced it themselves, surely it is time that words are followed with actions by protecting green spaces like this. In words published on the council's own website, it states, natural habitats, <coughs> wildlife and biodiversity are in peril not only from climate change, but they are being adversely affected by human intervention, which in turn is enhancing the effects of climate change. Follow through with your words and help us protect our meadow. Thank you. And finally, we've got Karen Player. to have her three minutes, please. Okay, well, I can only echo what everybody has said about um, the meadows. And I brought my own child up on the meadows, and we had picnics, etc., etc. And we, we all know that. But the reason I'm kind of sat here now is my parents lived 
in Waltham House, 39 flats of older people with limited mobility, and my father and my mother hugely enjoyed going down there. It was the only place they could go that was grey green, which was in walking distance, and they could sit in the sun and just enjoy those last years. My father died in July, so I'm quite upset. And my mother was really keen to, to put a bench on there and create a legacy so that we could perhaps have a sensory garden or walkways. Yeah. And I come back on Wednesday and I find that this is happening. So I'm deeply shocked and I have been part of wondering what's going on when we've given away so many of our green patches of land up Cromford Road, Spring Close, further up Steeple Grange. And now we are giving away Old Lane, which is not green field, it is brown field, but it is the most gorgeous green. And that's for 150 houses. And we're also giving over four houses, about 650 houses, it will probably be a thousand, that we've given over to Tarmac to develop the quarry, which we're not going to. We want our town to be vibrant. But if these are the plans that Worksworth has and the Derbyshire County Council has for the development of Worksworth, and then starts to grab that last piece of little green land, I find that there can be absolutely no justification for this. Absolutely none. And while I come to politics, and I'm not a politician, but I understand politics, and particularly Conservative small z, politics is about retaining, and it's about working in groups and coming to the right sort of conclusion that is for the good of the community. If you make this decision to allow the seller to sell this piece of land, you will be doing this to the detriment of the whole community mm -hmm. and to the benefit of one. Mm -hmm. And I ask you, particularly in these political times, to actually look at your consciences and for once mm -hmm. vote in the right way. It's probably off mark, but that's all I have to say. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I, 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 well, I, 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 yeah, so, yes, if we could wait for the agenda, please, uh, That's public participation. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for speaking so eloquently, so perfectly on your subject. Thank you. Um, uh, item three, approval of the minutes of the previous meeting on the 25th of July. Can I move it, please? Uh, Councillor Purdy, seconder. Councillor Swindell, thank you. All those in favour, please show. Thank you very much. Interest. Nobody has uh, intimated any interest um, this afternoon or prior to this meeting. No interest registered. No, that's item four. Uh, and we just move on to item five, leaders' announcements. Uh, Councillor Perry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, at 7 a.m. on Tuesday morning last, Councillor Sue Hobson and myself met with the Green and Clean team at the Councillor Depot at Dolly Dale. The purpose of this meeting was twofold. <coughs> to thank the staff for the hard work they carry out for Dr. Dales, and two, to identify any issues with them that might help to improve the service to the public of Dr. Dales. It proved to be a very constructive and useful meeting with all of the staff, and provides a valuable assessment of the current service. On 4th of September, myself, Councillor Swartzen, Paul Wilson, had a very constructive meeting with Andrew McCloy, Chairman of the National Peak Park Authority, and the CEX Sarah Fowler. I am confident that this will lead to a beneficial relationship, although there is much change of thought due to the final report on the National Parks by Julian Glover. I believe we need to keep a close eye on the developments of the Peak Park. On October 15, I attend the Climate Change Summit organized by the Peak District National Park Authority in Buxton, when I'm sure it will prove to be a springboard towards stronger relationships between Dogs authorities and the issue we face on climate change. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. Um, item seven, uh, maiden speeches. For those of you who are unfamiliar with our procedures, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen at the back, um, uh, the, there was obviously an election in, in May and we, we gained new members from all over the district. And so we've now instigated a programme of maiden speeches, which is what it says on the tin, about the, the various individuals to um, introduce themselves to, uh, to, to, to their fellow councillors in, in, in our chamber. So we've got three tonight, and I'd like to, to, to invite Councillor... Can I have a bigger point? Yes, we do that one afternoon. Bigger point. I'm getting too excited, sorry, but I missed my line. Uh, if we can move on to the, the main speeches to receive um, Councillor Wayne. 
please first. Chairman, members of the and officers of the council, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> thank you for the opportunity to address you. I hope that by the end of my speech, you will have a clear idea about who I am, my motivations, and my values. I am exceptionally fortunate to have been born and lived in the Derbyshire Dales for most of my life. It is therefore not surprising that I care passionately about this beautiful area. I served in the Derbyshire Constabulary from 1976 until 2014, working mostly on the investigation of crime, where I developed many skills, including the ability to attend to detail, to work in an evidence-based manner, to be persistent, disciplined, and conscientious. As a detective sergeant leading various specialist crime teams, I instilled into officers the need for honesty, integrity of action, the importance of challenge, the need for consistency, and to be inclusive and fair to all. Above all, when working on complex situations, the need to listen and respect the rights of those we served. All of these qualities are necessary as a councillor, representing residents and working with officers to ensure that decisions that are made are robust, the best ones, the right ones, and fair. Since retiring, I've continued to work in the local community, which has made me realise how many lonely, isolated people there are living in neighbourhoods who need access to quality local services. I've seen firsthand the personal commitment and cost to some who are working hard to try to protect their community by seeking to ensure the right decisions are made about where they live. I've been inspired by their commitment and drive to be heard when faced with complicated bureaucracy, which appears to frustrate and be difficult to navigate. I am now more familiar with the process of district government, the difficulties that come with reduced budgets and the legal constraints that sometimes dictate what must happen. However, I do believe that no matter the constraints we can always make improvements if we are brave and open enough to listen and consider to our alternative points of view. I hope to be able to engage with all political groups in meaningful debate, ensuring that the decision-making process is open and transparent. To improve the way residents are kept informed, reducing the amount of negative comment to the council <coughs> regarding the council and keeping conspiracy theories in check. To continue to create more housing which is affordable, available across the whole of the Derbyshire Dales, including the Peak Park, enabling our young people to remain in their communities. To develop a more solution-focused approach to maintaining all of our public parks and green spaces, which encourages communities to be proud of their neighbourhoods, despite reduced budgets. Working smarter by engaging with local people and external partners will create capacity and get things done. Responding to local residents and being clear about what we are doing to respond to environmental concerns. Our young people especially demand this and demand to know what we are doing to reduce our harmful activities. I am proud to be a councillor and will act to do the best of my ability to represent all residents of the Derbyshire Dales. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Wade. Uh, next we have... Thank you. Next we have Councillor O'Brien, please. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, for the benefit of members of the public, I'm uh, Peter O'Brien, and I was elected as a councillor for uh, Hathersage and Team uh, back in May. Uh, colleagues, since uh, May the 2nd, several of you have asked me why I stood for election. Uh, to answer that, I like to ask you to imagine for the next three or four minutes that you are a member of a young family in Hellasage, Heme or Brindleford, probably in your mid to late twenties, went to school in the village, then to Hope Valley College, managed to find a job locally, you've been living with your parents for the past few years while you're safe, while you're safe and you're now looking to buy your first house. So let's look and see what's on offer. In Hallisage, you can have a small terrace for £300,000. You can have a six bedroom detached for £625,000. A five bedroom detached for £875,000. Or a six bedroom manor house for £3 million. In Eam, you could own 50% of a two bedroom terrace for £110,000. You could buy a muse house for £325,000. Buy a three bedroom semi. It's 375,000, a four bedroom detached for 500,000. 
or a three-bedroom link detached for 550,000. If you live in Grindleford, you could have a three-bedroom cottage with room for improvement, 475,000. A six-bedroom detached, 1.7 million. Or a six-bedroom detached for 2.49 million. Now, while you're picking yourself up from the floor from that shop, shop, a friend suggests finding a place to rent. And yes, you have a choice of one, a two-bedroom first floor flat in Harrisage. All is not lost, however. You just receive a text from a friend who you grew up with in the village. She invites you to a housewarming party in a brand new two-bedroom townhouse she just bought for 120,000 in Sheffield. <laughs> the same situation I've highlighted in Hathersage Eam and Grindleford, I think equally applies in many other villages, in Stanton, in Great Longston, in Winster, and in Baslow. I mention these villages specifically because housing issues do not respect political affiliations. <coughs> Living in the Peak District, Peak District, bringing up a family, is fast becoming a privilege rather than a right. I look forward to all of us continuing to work together to ensure that a decent, affordable home to live in becomes a right, not a privilege, in every part of the day of Derbyshire Dales. And uh, Councillor Rawl, please, your three minutes, please. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Okay. Um, I was elected along with Peter as a Labour councillor. I was asked <coughs> to stand, I think, because I've got a bit of a, a fiery character, and socialism is in my day, DNA. Um, I've lived in the Hope Valley for 18 years and I'm very passionate about wildlife as some of you would know. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank those of you who responded to my letter about the proposed badger and um, report that I'm pleased to say that the proposed cull in Derbyshire is not going ahead. Mm. And this is a real example of how we can actually, as community members, create change uh, in our communities um, and it was due to the active <coughs> lobbying of residents and uh, local wildlife organisations. So we've got additional monies going into the vaccination programme in Derbyshire um, but the government sadly has issued 11 new licences including Cheshire and Staffordshire which are on our borders and we know that um, <coughs> there is um, culling going ahead in those areas. Altogether, this will result in 63,000 badgers being slaughtered, um, which I just find horrific. <coughs> it's an expensive waste of taxpayers' money. There's no significant scientific proof um, that this is effective. Um, the tests are 45% um, effective. Um, recently I've been doing a lot of reading upon this and Dr. Brian May uh, is campaigning for the expansion of the use of biosecurity measures and this is something that I think is really relevant and important in the blocking of transmission routes for cattle against bovine TB. He's proved that this has been successful in a small project in Devon and resulted in no cattle being slaughtered. Um, the government expects farmers using uh, biosecurity measures to fund any additional expenditure that might be incurred themselves. The changes that May introduced were, were very straightforward, simple sorts of um, ideas really. It was about cleaning, refilling water troughs, fewer cattle in each barn, increased cleanliness in water, in, in, on walkways, maternity use units for, um, for the cattle with rubber floor mats that could be disinfected, <coughs> and it's 
it's um, been successful in um, stopping the spread of, of the disease, which is, you know, really, really um, good. And I think surely this method of reducing the risk of TB warrants further in investigation and research funded through the government. And we should be supporting farmers to use these uh, methods of farming cattle that are better for animal welfare and will uh, stop the spread of, uh, of bovine TV. The badges of Derbyshire have a repeat until May next year when the coal licences for Derbyshire will be looked at again and possibly renewed. So I will be badgering you all, pardon the pun, to be sending letters out again and um, I plan to talk to uh, members of the NUF about the project that Dr May set up and looking at how we can support local farmers to look at different ways that um, we can protect our, our cattle from bovine TB. So thank you for your time, um, for listening to me about something that's very close to my heart, that I'm very passionate about, as you as you will become aware. Okay. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll move back to item six, the chairman's announcement. So, Councillor Morley, I apologise. I'm, uh, I'm glad to see that I haven't offended you in any way, Mr Chairman. That was nothing personal. Uh, quiet time uh, for the Chair, I'm pleased to report. However, I did want to get on the agenda because I'd like to get a plug-in for the great privilege of opening or switching on the Matlock Bath Illuminations. And they're on till the end of uh, October and I strongly recommend that everybody gets along there. It's a super show. Matlock Bath <coughs> Illuminations. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, just to members of the public, you can feel free to go at any time. You don't feel you have to, 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 to stay for any particular item. Um, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, item 8, <coughs> committees, to receive the non-exempt minutes of the committees shown below. Can I have a present? Oh, sure. Councillor Donnelly, seconder, please. Uh, Councillor Saul. Uh, all those in favour, please show. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, question 9. It's, it's been requested that um, we're now on to questions. Uh, item nine, and we have six. And, and, and Chair, thought of information, if I, if I may just... Uh, uh, in uh, what uh, respect, have uh, Would you allow me to read my second question uh, first, since it, it follows on very much from the speakers who come from my... Oh, uh, no, right, sorry. What I was going to say, yes. Yes, Ratcliffe, is that the procedure now is that I will read the question out for the purposes oh, of excellent. YouTube, oh. so everybody yes. who's watching in, yes. both of them, uh, are, are, are conversing with our conversation. <laughs> the second and then, one first. Then you, of course you can read out your supplementary yeah. if, you, if, you, you. You know, if, if when you have one. Okay. Right, thank you very much. So this is the question from Councillor Mike Ratcliffe to, 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 to Councillor Purdy. Um, I quote. I would once again like to thank all parties... Oh, no, no, Chair. Would you do the second one first? Because oh, I see. I mean, yes, would you like to do B first? So I would do your supplementary. Yes. Got it. We will go to number B. Yeah. Okay, cut for YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> B, from Councillor Mike Bradley up to Councillor Gary Burley. Is the leader of the council aware of the strong level of dissatisfaction in the Wordsworth community over the recent decision not to confirm the nomination of the Meadows as an asset of community value? A submission supported by the Worksworth Civic Society, the Community Land Trust, and the Town Council. This green space is policy protected by both the Derbyshire Dales Local Plan and the Worksworth Neighbourhood Plan, and has long been regarded as an integral part of the town's recreational and leisure environment. It makes a recognisable contribution to our quality of life, situated as it is at the heart of the community, providing a visible and tangible buffer between the shopping centre and residential housing estate. It has two rights of way, allowing for a constant flow of residents who clearly see it as high in the community's index of social value and interest." Unquote. Councillor Purdy. Well, thank you for your question, Councillor Ratcliffe. Um, yes, I am aware, uh, not only from the excellent presentations by the speakers tonight, which have been made, but having seen the emails, uh, I sought out and met with Tim Braun, and I thank Tim for his time to yeah. bring him up to speed on this. So I am aware of this issue, but I must point out that decisions over assets of community value are correctly delegated by the Council's policy 
officer level rather than to council or committee. Having said that, I also know that the ACV regime is separate from planning and that different tests apply. <coughs> the land already enjoys some protection by virtue of the inclusion in the local plan and in the Worksworth neighbourhood plan. It is my understanding that in considering the ACV nomination, the <coughs> investigating officer was not able to identify an actual current use of the building or other land that is not an ancillary use that furthers the social well-being or social interests of the local community, such as organised sport or social gathering, which is one of the tests within the legislation. Councillor Rett, if you have um, the right to supplementary question. Uh, I, I, I do, Chair, and, and thank you for that, uh, uh, Gary. I mean, you won't be surprised to know that, of course, I had uh, prior discussions with uh, uh, our head of regulating services, and I have to say, I, I have some understanding now of the constraints, if you like, that uh, he, he was under when he had to reach this decision. I have to say it's a decision that I, I am uh, very much opposed to, and I, I think uh, it's just yet one more aspect of the government's 2011 Localism Act that half-heartedly was uh, intended to give power to, to our communities. Is this a supplementary yes. question? I have, yes. yeah. Would the leader of the council agree with me that one of the district council's responsibilities is to promote and support the well-being of its residents. Yeah. This sense of contentment, satisfaction and happiness is promoted and added to by an appreciation of the quality of life engendered in the localities of our residents. Not all of it can be measured in the physical terms of numbers. The abstract sense of enjoyment and the high regard that communities have for the environment in which they live is significant. High social value and interest is given to green spaces and common land, and their protection is of paramount importance in planning terms. But support is needed above and beyond this, and unfortunately, in this case, a prescriptive interpretation of the community asset criteria uh, was perceived by the Worksworth community as somewhat contradictory contradicting that support that was expected of the district. Councillor Well, of course, Councillor Ratcliffe, I agree that this council is concerned about the well-being of its constituents without doubt, but according to the Constitution, and an officer decision has been made in the name of the council. Thank you. We'll now move on to um, uh, the first question, which is agenda uh, uh, number, a, number A. And I'll read out the question again. Okay. So this is the question from my Radcliffe again to Councillor Gary Furley. I quote, I'd once again like to thank all party leaders and council members for their unanimous support in adopting this council's climate emergency motion. Would the council leader now be prepared to give his support to the following measures to make this local authority free single-use plastic? One, DDDC would initially, where feasible, seek, uh, seek to remove single-use plastic from its premises. Two, DDDC would encourage plastic-free initiatives. Three, DDDC would look closely at a procurement strategy that seeks not to use single plastics. Four, DDDC would issue press coverage and publicity to promote its adopted single-use plastic-free profile, unquote. Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Chair. Thank you again, Councillor Ratcliffe, for your question. These matters are for consideration by the Climate Change Working Group, who are tasked with considering the issue as a holistic matter, rather than in regard to isolated matters. The Climate Change Working Group must therefore be allowed to conduct their work which will be reported to the council, as you know, periodically. The group have provided a roadmap which I believe should be followed. I might add, the council does employ a recycling advisor who has already undertaken work aimed at reducing single-use plastic within the council. Members will be interested to know that the current post order is moving on and the vacancy that this has created is currently advertised. 
climate change working group might be able to raise with the new post holder hold this issue when he or she is imposed. Professor Ratcliffe, your supplementary. I, I don't have a supplementary, but I want to thank you for, for, for that response. I'm greatly encouraged that uh, we are prepared to uh, include this initiative in, in our uh, strategic uh, approach to climate change. Uh, I personally would see it as perhaps slightly separate from carbon emission, emission reduction. However, uh, I, 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 I think uh, anything that we can do to uh, bring about um, uh, this and indeed uh, 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 a more sensible uh, approach to uh, climate change uh, I think is to be welcome uh, and, and let's hope we can see the fruition uh, of this as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Okay. Now we have uh, question C and so David do you want to read this one out? It's your question. Would you like to? I'll read it out. Thank you. Um, I'll take the second one as my supplementary <laughs> as well because there are two questions there. At the last planning committee meeting, the chair of the planning committee told me that the removal of an area of grass where children could play was not a material planning consideration. The conclusion that I drew was that the chair of the planning committee does not believe that children's play areas are an amenity. Can the chair reassure me that he does in fact consider that play areas are an amenity and therefore the provisional removal should be considered when evaluating planning <coughs> applications? Thank you for your question, Councillor Hoops. I believe this, this question relates to an application that was considered at the planning committee earlier this month. The question arose in the debate about an application to create a vehicle access into the back garden of a property. The debate spread out to consider an area of land that was not part of the application being considered, but which might be used as a play area. This should not have formed part of the consideration of the application in front of the committee as it was not related in that sense, the chair was quite correct that the matter was not a material consideration for that particular application. I can assure you that uh, the officer has revisited the YouTube on this and been able to formulate this answer. I can assure you that the chair of the planning committee is fully aware of the local plan policy relating to open space and outdoor recreation facilities, as are our planning officers, and that this policy will be considered and apply where it is relevant to do so. Do you want to read the further part of the question or do you have a supplementary? No, I think I, I'm, I'm satisfied with the answer. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay. And, uh, and he's answered, the Chair has answered my thank second you. question. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so we'll move on to uh, number D, which is from Councillor Cruz. Uh, would you like to read yours out? Give me a break. Thank Why you. Not, Chair? Thank you. Could the leader please explain what risk assessment has been done to evaluate the risk on Derbyshire Dales District Council's mid-term financial plan of Brexit and no deal Brexit? There's a, an extra part of the question. Could the leader please highlight what assessment has been done on the impact of Brexit on EU funding grants and EU supported programmes, e.g. D2, N2, that enable Derbyshire Dales District Council to support local business development? Thank you. Thank you for the question, Councillor Cruz. I have previously answered a question relating to the Council's planning for a no deal EU exit at an earlier Council meeting. Since then, the Government has released its Operation Yellow Hammer, reasonable worst case planning assumptions. Mid term financial planning is not an issue that is raised in that document, although it is stated that some cross border financial services might be disrupted. Additional costs of the EU exit have not been reflected in the Council's medium-term financial plan because we consider that one of costs relating to EU exit could be funded from the grant that we have received from the Government or, in the unlikely event that this is insufficient, from the General Reserve. At the current time, we have not identified any significant ongoing increase in costs arising from the EU exit. I also understand that officers are considering whether some changes need to be made to our Treasury management arrangements in this respect, but that no final decision has been made on this yet. In the short to medium term, there is no impact from Brexit on EU funding grants and business support. Existing schemes have been underwritten to 2022, so there will be no immediate change. Importantly, this includes the funding that pays half the cost 
of the Derbyshire Dales Business Advisor via the D2 N2 Growth Hub, which is confirmed up to 31st of March 2022. In the longer term, the situation is not certain, much as it would be anyway whenever a funding programme is due to end. The government has indicated that it will replace EU funding with a UK <coughs> So far, no details of the shared prosperity fund have been provided. From the Derbyshire Dales perspective, the key risk with the shared prosperity fund is that the terms and processes by which the fund is distributed are not geared to rural areas. To address this, the District Council is lobbying, lobbying the Local Enterprise Partnership to acknowledge the needs of smaller business in rural areas. I would add that a recent meeting with the Chair of D2N2 and the CEX by myself, Paul Wilson, Councillor Sir Watson, we did press the point on rurality, and I was given a categoric personal assurance by both Sir Gina Rose and uh, Elizabeth Fagan that they do give due regard to our rural. Mr. Cruz, thank you for the detail and a good response, Councillor Burley. Um, in terms of a supplementary question, a point really, and then a, and then a question. Um, just in terms of the impact, Bank of England impact suggesting 5.5%, <coughs> uh, so that's a doubling of inflation. Mm. So straight away that could have a hit on the cost base of the council. So I, just, I do think we ought to find a way to, uh, to visit this through a a governance committee or something uh, subsequently to go into a little bit more detail. Mm. Uh, and I think the, the other thing that I did want to mention was um, was around, I think the, the, the feedback on the, the funding around the business advisors obviously is very positive uh, and, and the feedback from the rurality. Um, but the other thing is the impact on unemployment. So unemployment is looking to go up, uh, doubling to, uh, to 7% as well. So, um, so I think it'd be good to have a view of a risk assessment. That's my, probably my key supplementary question. Is there a way that we can have a sensitivity done on our financial planning so that we can really understand the impact? I think my best answer to that is that I will engage with Karen Erickson, take advice and come back to you and I'll feed that back to all members. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, question E, uh, Councillor Gamble, would you like to read yours out, please?
they will be performed. Okay, thank you very much. So, Councillor Campbell, would you like to uh, read your uh, number F question? It's about yellow hammer. Okay. The public case of Operation Yellowhammer has taken the secrecy out of the no deal Brexit preparations. Therefore, can the leader tell me when Brexit will go on the risk register? The public document that identifies risks and the measures needed to mitigate those risks. I want to know how the immediate risks, such as fuel shortages, fuel shortages will be mitigated, and whether the council buys any products products that could be affected by delays at ports. Mm. Councillor Perry. Again, thank you for your question, Councillor Gamble. I mean, I understand that you've had a very comprehensive uh, reply recently from our Chief Executive, Mr Wilson. Councillor Gamble is quite correct in stating that details of Operation Yellowhammer, Her Majesty's Government's reasonable worst-based planning assumption have now been released. As previously stated, the Council works with partners within the Derbyshire Local Resilience Forum on planning for major events such as Brexit. Some of the assumptions listed mm -hmm. in Operation Yellowhammer can reasonably be seen to have the potential to impact on the District Council and as such have been included in the Council's Strategic Risk Register. It is my understanding that officers are now working on a more operational risk register as 31st of October approaches, <coughs> and that this operational risk register will consider actions to mitigate the potential impacts listed in Yellowhammer in more detail. Following the advice of the LRF and their Majesty's Government, we are still of the view that the contents of the operational risk register should be treated as sensitive at the current time. But I do understand that the potential for fuel shortages and supply chain disruption as listed in Yellowhammer are being considered. For information, the Council received significant funds from HMG to help mitigate any effects of Brexit, and these funds are held in reserve in order to be utilised if required. Councillor Gamble. Thank you. Uh, right, actually, my supplementary is more to do with, I did cover with, uh, just to confirm that my, my meeting wasn't with Mr Wilson, but... I didn't say meeting, I said that conference. <coughs> well, okay, I, I haven't had any communication from Mr Wilson, either by writing or in person. Well, um, um, but regardless, anyway, um, on this. Um, my, so my, my question actually is on the, as a result of the meeting that I did have with Tim Blount and Karen Hankinson, on the risk register actually, which I understand is a public document, um, which I needed to come in to come and see because apparently it's produced in a format which is means that someone has to come look at it on a screen and it, and it can't be made into a paper format. So my question is, what happens if you're ever given a Freedom of Information request to see this document? Councillor Perling. Question, I can't give the answer at the moment. I'll find out the answer for you, Councillor Gamble, will come back to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. That ends the questions. We may move on to item 10. Um, uh, Councillor Purdy. Yeah, so this was about the proposal of motion. Thank you. Since I uh, received this application or consideration of this motion from a constituent in Dorsha Dales, which I took advice on, uh, which seemed quite simple in the format in the question, and other authorities have approved. Um, there have been a number of emails from members which has made me decide to withdraw the motion. Uh, I think that it's best that we convene in the future with other members to consider a uniform approach to this, because I have to say that in some of the email as I was concerned that it was taking away the essence of that original motion uh, and was giving it a different colour and flavour. So I'm not happy to move the motion, I'm withdrawing it, I will consult and I think it's best that we take a uniform approach as a council and agree on the right motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we move on to item 11, uh, the update from the Climate Change Working Group. It's already been mentioned uh, a few times this evening. Uh, Tim Broad, please. Thank you, Chair. Well, although the report's written in my name uh, in accordance with Council Convention, um, what I'm actually going to do is hand over to Councillor Chapman, who's Chair of the Climate Change Working Group. All the report seeks to do is to introduce the work that's been done over the last couple of meetings of the group, uh, and particularly to highlight the roadmap that the group has developed. Um, so, Councillor Chapman, over to you. Thank you, Tim. Um, 
Yeah, first of all, I'd, I'd just like to say how, how impressive and how um, enjoyable it's been working with the, with the uh, people on this group. It's a, it's a cross-party, it's a, a wide-ranging knowledge, wide-ranging enthusiasms, uh, and in the case of our Green Party member, a, an entertaining slight hint of surrealism. <laughs> so, but yeah, can I, 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 will, I will start by, I, I will go straight in with the roadmap. Um, I mean, it, it is fairly self-explanatory, but I would like to, <coughs> obviously the first, the first column is, is our ambition, and that's a zero carbon by 2030. Um, but I would like to use Councillor Ratcliffe's question uh, as a means of, of maybe a, a guidance through this, um, through this roadmap. Uh, and let me stress, this is a movable feast. We are, we are very open to any in, in suggestions, help, requests, concerns by members and by the general public to, to add to this or to, to challenge this. And to that end, um, we will be uh, forming a dedicated email address for anyone to, to put those questions to. <coughs> Although, or any comments, uh, and I think Sandra, that will be probably in force maybe next week, and and we'll probably put that up on the yeah. website for yeah. people to, to 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 use. So I would ask you to use that when it becomes available, so that we can disseminate um, what what's relevant, what's appropriate, and and how we go about things. But but with regards to Mark Ratcliffe's um, comments. I, um, first number one, where he says the DDC would initially wear feasible seat to remove single-use plastic from its premises. Well, if you look at if you look at the roadmap and you go to um, column A, number two, uh, you'll see that that's labelled promoting a sustainable environment. That links on the top link to DDDC buildings. Well, that is exactly one of the things, Mike, that we will be looking at uh -huh. as relevant to DCC. Yeah. There isn't room on this on this map to put everything that we will no, be doing, yeah, but yeah. rest assured that it falls within that category yeah. in that roadmap. Yeah. Your second point, um, DDC would encourage plastic plastic free initiatives. Again, if, if we look down um, column B and we look leading the way on climate change, We've got case studies of good practice, yeah. and the third question would look closely at procurement strategy. You'll find that we've got procurement in that box, and procurement won't just end at plastics or consumables. It will look at, at equipment, where it's come from, the carbon footprint of, of the country that supplied it, and, and it's, it, it will be um, it will be covered by those by those topics. So. We, we've got a we've got a broad ranging um, remit here, but but I hope you'll agree that that we've covered the main topics because our priority will be to look at the carbon footprint of this council, and uh, but that is not to say that we will not be looking at the wider district and advising using advocacy to 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 promote and to and to help reach that target. I'm going to go a bit off track here. <coughs> um, the, the, one of the most enlightening things I heard this week was was this, was the statement by Antonio Guterres, the United Nations Secretary General, mm -hmm. on the eve of the climate change conference. He said, "I've asked I have asked leaders to come here and not give fancy speeches." Well, I think that didn't happen. I, 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 I think I think we can look at the climate change conference in New York is not so much a glass half full but as a glass maybe three quarters empty. This is not enough. This is a small part of what has to be done. Yeah, yeah. But I will in the course of the development of this group and, and, the, and the strategy and the roadmap, I would like to add in column A a fourth box which says lobbying apathetic governments because without that change, yeah. I, this is not to denigrate anything that anybody does. I mean, we, we've had the, 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 the um, comments about the illuminations and the change of rules. That's great, that has to be done. Everything, everything plays a part. But if we didn't have China making, building two coal plants a week, then we wouldn't have to be so concerned and we wouldn't have to have this kind of emergency. 
So we have to use this as a stepping stone, as a bottom-up way of making our government and world governments realise that they have got to put into this <coughs> way, way more than they are doing at the moment. Sorry if this is a soapbox, but it's something I feel strongly about. And I feel that we should show the lead that they ought to take up and expand on. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Chairman, are you moving the recommendation? <laughs> Councillor Bryan. I'll second it, uh, if I may say something, Chair, as well. Yeah, um, I sit on the, the, the panel as well, and I also have to share um, Councillor Chapman's uh, thoughts on the other members. It's, it's really nice to sit in the chamber and not have any political agendas there. Um, it's really refreshing, and I thoroughly enjoy working on it. What I would say is that um, Councillors, uh, other things that we're doing, if I may build on Councillor Chapman, is we are. Um, we're reaching out, the officers are doing a great job reaching out to experts all over the country, other councils who have done things that we, we could look at as gold standard. Uh, so we're not having to reinvent everything. So we are doing that. And another thing that this report does, does uh, allude to is the fact that we are, we are trying to educate and empower people of Derbyshire Dale. That's one of the things we're going to try and do through the council to make changes themselves. You know, you can hit people with a stick or you can give them a carrot. If we're given the carrot, they'll be more likely to keep doing the things that help, you know, help us with the the climate emergency. So those are the things we're looking to do. So uh, uh, I'll second this report. Okay, thank you. I've got a number of speakers, and if I can all, all, all ask you to be, um, you know, pertinent with your with your comments, please, and concise. Uh, Councillor Martin Burford first, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'm glad to see this uh, item hasn't been withdrawn. It disappointed about the previous uh, motion which. The Liberal Democrat group has spent a lot of time discussing, and I hope we haven't wasted our time. Can I can ask, uh, first of all, I want to speak on the debate, but uh, three, or three or four questions. First of all, what are the objective dates in this roadmap? There aren't any interim dates up to 2030. There must be some interims that have been proposed, I guess. Uh, secondly, um, will information be provided to members um, on, the, on the meetings? I think probably two or three have been held so far. Because those of us not on the working party don't know anything that's happening, to be honest, until this uh, brief report was uh, surfaced, was proposed tonight. Um, secondly, uh, will every council report in the future be assessed uh, against climate change impacts? Uh, every report, so you know, it, it's, it's, uh, every report is um, is judged on various other criteria. So, will they in, in future be assessed vis-à-vis uh, -vis climate change impacts? And the, third, the next question is, are officers, oh no, that's one to be answered about best practice elsewhere, sorry, that's, that's okay. So, so three questions. All right, thank you very much. We'll, we'll take uh, a lot of the speakers first, please. Councillor Pawley. <coughs> yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I've got three, but they're very short questions. Uh, first of all, on the, on the actual plan that we've got here, uh, number three, development. Uh, <coughs> it doesn't yeah. seem to have any arrows going forward. So I wonder why that was. Is it something to do with the fact that those ones below it should be attached to it, or have they got themselves attached to the first box by mistake? Uh, the second one is, um, we know that Dave Turby has been very prompt in trying to do things with the illuminations. Um, are other officers doing similar things? Um, and the third one is, um, I've been told that you have not got many resources to support this group. In fact, you haven't got anybody who takes minutes. And I think it would be good if we had somebody it took minutes to um, uh, pass those on to yeah. other members. So, can you confirm that you haven't got anybody who's taking minutes for you? And if you please, could you could it be arranged? Could we give them that much resource, please? Uh, shall I have Tim to answer some of those questions, or David? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Thanks, Councillor. Um, really, and, and to answer Martin's question as well. The, the remit of this group was to bring a, a, a report to council within six months. Yeah. Now, the, we've had two meetings, and, and really, there wouldn't have been a lot to report because we were we were aiming to achieve this. This is the starting point. This is where it all it all begins to to, to work out to work into place. So, uh, to answer your question, Joyce, we we are having someone. I think Tim will confirm to to be a minute secretary from from now on basically. Mm -hmm. I can't remember anything. Uh, the last one was um, <coughs> sorry, the first one rather was um, <coughs> why are there no lines coming out of development and opportunities? 
because we haven't really looked at those in close detail yet. We, we, we feel that the opportunities will arise from what we're looking at trying to achieve and, and the opportunities we can, I mean, it'll be things like grant, if we can, if we can get grant funding and stuff like that, but we, we haven't got to that stage. So it is a, it'll, it'll have some lines on hopefully, but there aren't any at the moment. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Tim. To, to just add a bit to that, if I may, um, uh, for information members, uh, there is now a Derbyshire-wide officers group looking at climate change issues, which is chaired by um, the Climate Change and Sustainability Officer of the County Council. That's met once. Um, in common with many other authorities, most other authorities in Derbyshire, we don't have a Climate Change and Sustainability Officer here at Derbyshire Dale, so there isn't a single officer who provides a level of resourcing to the group in that way. Uh, what the group has at the moment is, is some of my time and and knowledge, I suppose, of how the council works. In terms of administrative support to the uh, to the group, something Sandra and I have spoken about previously, which we're looking to, to provide, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Ratcliffe, next, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Can I say thank you to uh, uh, Councillor Chapman for starting us off on this uh, journey. Um, I just want to refer him, if I may, to the fourth part of the question I asked about single-use uh, plastics and just ask uh, Councillor Chapman if you'd care at some point, not uh, for tomorrow, but of course, but uh, at some point to liaise with Jim, Jim Fern uh, to think about uh, issuing publicity and feedback to the general public. I think a better publicity and profiling for us on this issue uh, would do us no harm whatsoever. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, we most certainly will be publicising it when we've got something that's really worth publicising. Yeah. And, and obviously, um, I'd just like to add that the comment you made about plastics not being strictly climate change, but uh, if you look at the second at B column down at the bottom, this was one of the the last box in the in the line and this was one that i personally wanted to um to have in there even though it's not it is partly climate change but it covers what you're saying and we've got biodiversity and ecosystem services and and obviously in the case of plastic that's where um marine life is severely affected yeah. uh, i mean we don't have any marine life but of course it's the use of single plastics that mm. eventually gets into the oceans so that is really something that is, you know, it's it's sort of a an add-on, if you like. Uh, it's not strictly CO2 equivalents, but it it's to, it's affecting yeah. the okay. ecosystem, which which I didn't want to exclude. Thank you, Councillor Sue Burford. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to just ask about electric charging points. Um, I was asked by a constituent uh, a week or so ago. Um, about whether they were going to be president because they were thinking of buying a, an electric car. So that set off a train of thought and I have to admit I haven't read the Governance and Resources Committee agenda so Tim kindly reminded me that it was there and then I've had a very full report from Keith Postlethwaite. But my question really is I see under tourism engagement we've got electric vehicle charging points now i hope that the committee will consider what we are able to do for our residents and i hope that's something that you will take up i, I was a little surprised to see it under tourism engagement because we've got residents who want to yeah. do the right thing yeah, yeah it, it, it also comes under the, the box above as well see but EV charging points to the town hall. Um, yeah, but we. I mean, we are looking. Obviously, an EV charging will be a, a, a large part of our remit. But I think we we, we have to realise how far we can go with with the residents part because that that and and, and really, I suppose you'd, you'd look at that further down where we've got it embedding in core strategy. So we'll be looking to to make that point. The, the main chair, it was to do with um, having, you know, 
putting um, these charging points in, in, in some of our car parks so that residents can use them if they haven't got any way of doing it at anywhere else. Well, I think we can we can act as advocates on that, but, but for the actual logistics of it, we'd have to pass that over to, to whoever's got the resources. We can make that point and and and, and sort of strongly make that point, but but we are in the hands of the people who are actually bringing about that. Thank you, Councillor Purdy. Uh, thank you, Chair. For the benefit of Councillor Bairdfoot, Sue Bairdfoot, um, on this issue of EBAs, please. Uh, I've had a meeting yesterday with Keith Bosselthwaite on this very issue uh, and it's really a case of supply and demand uh, not us putting EVAs out into car parks and then nobody using them. I'm led to understand for example that the council in the Lincolnshire area has gone ahead and put them in all their car parks and they're not being used. So I think we need to wait for the relationship we've got with Derbyshire County Council for the second phase. Uh, where this proposal for a, you know set more considerations, I think that's been the road to take. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Slack. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, David, and the group for making a great start. And uh, um, I, my views are, are really views; they're not criticisms, really. The three questions, really. Trans the first one's about transport. I well, I welcome the proposed uh, V charger on the V. EV charger points on the town hall, Matlock town hall, but, but would it did, I would have liked to seen the first EV charging points installed at Harrison Way, that, which is the main depot for our transport transport fleet. The, if the EVs were put in at tran, the transport depots, it would be ready for renewable of the vehicles, which when they come to the end of the life, the diesel and petrol vehicles, <coughs> ready for uh, electric vans and electric lorries. So, uh, points put in Ariston, Ariston Way are very, very important, I think. And uh, I hope that's in the pipeline. Uh, asking yourself and Tim if that's in the pipeline. Uh, my other two questions, the one's on building. I also will note that the DDC building will be assessed for better installation to save heat, but but also will there be an assessment of introducing solar panels on the DDC buildings to make electricity for running the offices, the workshops, and a great advantage of this at the weekends and at and lighter nights that it could be stored in the new batteries and now being developed long term long life batteries are now being developed to store electricity or if they are not available uh, fed into the grid to uh, make more revenue so that's the second question and also on uh, development of uh, buildings also could the group look at small wind turbines being introduced into the DDC buildings which are away from towns and urban areas so the smaller wind turbines as uh, they will generate night and day and uh, weekends and again put, could put into the lot new batteries being produced or into the national grid for making revenue so could these points all be looked at please? Uh, Tim would you like to take that? No, no, thank you Chair, yeah. Um, Stack, if you look at paragraph 2.2 .2 of the report it talks about there's four bullet points there which uh, the groups identified as priority areas to look at sooner rather than later their transport estates, planning policy and housing policy. Yeah. Um, your first question was about the council's fleet uh, and that would come under the transport heading. Uh, yeah, and we, we do have a vehicle replacement program as some members might be aware from when we talk about the capital program. Uh, and uh, Ash Watts, the head of uh, community development and environmental services is, is looking at electrical, electrical yeah, vehicles sure. as part of that work. Uh, not guaranteeing what he's going to come up with, but he is looking at it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so that, that's in hand. That's good. Uh, as far as solar panels go, there are uh, photovoltaic panels on this building. Yeah. We, we, we put those in some years ago when the roof was renewed. Um, and, it, and the second part, of the second bullet point on here, talks about our estate, um, which is, a, is a, a different way of saying, I suppose, looking at our carbon footprint. Uh, part of that will be looking at the potential for renewable energy on others of our building as well as here. Um, and your final point, I think, was about small wind turbines, which comes under the same heading. We haven't looked at that in as much detail as uh, solar generation previously. That's not to say we can't look at it. Don't know what the findings will be. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. much. Thank We've you. We've got Councillor Raw next. And then... Yeah, it was... Your mic, please. Thank you. 
It was just to David, really, generally. Um, we were talking about Europe before and, and Brexit, and um, the European Union does do a lot to protect our environment. Do you think it's going to have a particular impact on, on the work we do on this, this project? Are you, look, are you looking at that from a point of view of funding, Claire? Yes, and legislation, because when we come out, the, the legislation that we're under at the minute, under the EU, we'll have to wait until new legislation is developed in the UK. Um, I don't know in detail, it's just, it's just a concern that I just worry that it's going to be one of the impacts of, of coming out of the EU, is it's going to have a negative effect on uh, people supporting uh, the environment and there's going to be less protection in terms of legislation, etc. Can I, can I answer that by giving you an example that I'm involved with? Um, there's, a, there's a partnership which um, I, I chair called Morse for the Future Partnership. Um, and that's been funded by, uh, over the last seven or eight years by, by something called the, the Life Fund, which is an EC funding. And, and we've got through uh, funding Matt will tell me about 32 million euros, Matt, altogether. Yeah, and, and, and currently we are being told that we can still apply for life funding from the European Commission. So it could change overnight, but at the moment we are still looking, we're still uh, bidding for funding from European, that European agency. So aside from that, Claire, I, I wouldn't, I, I can't look that far no, in the future, no, but at the is. moment, the, the 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 Brexit doesn't seem to be affecting it. Fingers crossed. Thank you very much. And finally, Councillor Cruz. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Chapman was really uh, building on Councillor Burford's uh, earlier point. So in, ne in November, there'll be a, re a report coming to Council. I'm just wondering what the shape of that will be. Will it have a budget? Will it have an action plan? So what, what will it look like in November? Um, I would seriously think it wouldn't have any budget um, in there. Um, we'll, we will have, we'll, we'll have nailed down, um, we will have put flesh on the bones of, of column C, basically. We will have looked at how this applies to, um, I can't say we'll cover every topic because there's a lot there we may have to add some more if, if we get, um, if we get input from, from outside, from residents or whatever, but, but Certainly, there will be um, <coughs> a large number of, of those topics will have been investigated because there is a, an awful lot of work there, as I'm sure you appreciate. But we will, I, th I hate the phrase, um, but we're probably looking at the low hanging fruit to start with. So, Councillor Martin Burford, have you had your questions answered? Or was there one? Yes, um, I'll make a statement. Okay, very quickly, please, because I want to move on. Because this will be your second bite here. Yeah. Well, the question was first, yeah. this is the first part of this. Uh, um, uh, obviously, local authorities have limited capacity to influence the government in terms of climate change nationally, but uh, and obviously uh, EU withdrawal will make that worse in terms of cross-boundary uh, impacts as well. Uh, but in order to achieve the enormous transformation of climate um, locally, uh, we're going to have to do something. If we're going to, we've got this carbon neutral aim by 2030, uh, we, I wonder exactly what that does mean where the boundaries are, because obviously the District Council only has limited responsibility. Uh, but um, in terms of a list of achievements that I think we need to go for, obviously, as has been mentioned, staff cars and council vehicles must be all electric by then, as yeah. well, with charging points absolutely everywhere throughout the district. Mm -hmm. uh, all development to be sustainable with solar panels and highest possible energy efficiency in new building, yeah. new housing. Mm -hmm. uh, nil fossil fuel power use in District Council buildings. Um, a biodiversity action plan, I think, is required, and along with that, um, loads and loads of tree planting, basically. Uh, and I would back Gorilla Gardening, as a, a member for, uh, representative of Whitsworth uh, mentioned earlier, because I've done a bit of that in my time. Uh, that's on all district council land and housing developments as well, of course. Uh, there's not enough. There's, there's plenty of scope for new housing, new new tree planting in housing developments. Yeah. And I think landscape schemes uh, uh, that are subjected to conditions on uh, planning applications need to be resilient to climate change targets as well. 
And I think the council can also give advice to the public. I think that's a, a key um, objective that, the, that this working party should aim for. And that's to give uh, advice <coughs> to the government recycling about rubbish separ separation, home composting, food waste, grow your own, water books, bottled water, um, air conditioning uh, versus opening windows as we did in the old days and we still do now. <coughs> Tumble drives versus clothes on the line. Uh, lobbying local retailers, especially supermarkets, about single-use plastics and so on. But all these things that this council can do, and I think in terms of public education, um, there's a great deal that can be done. It doesn't cost yeah. too much to produce a leaflet, giving advice to the public about things which you do see from waste collection, uh, um, but when, on waste collection day, too many people still throw away too much rubbish. Uh, the grey bin is still overflowing with things that should be recycled. Uh, and our own litter bins, for instance, uh, in the parks and so on, uh, we should have them separated between um, recyclable waste and general waste, as we do on our doorstep. So those are things which I would just suggest as headlines, really, yeah. to start the ball but rolling. While you'd like to put your, send your um, observations into David for consideration, right. that'd be great. Is that all members are advised to do that? Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so I've got nobody else uh, on my list. So, Councillor, so do you want to finish? Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Our work is done. <laughs> um, I, I, I just really what I was going to say in seriousness was, was exactly what uh, Richard said. This is what the, the function of the dedicated email address is going to be for, yeah. to send us those kind of suggestions. Because they, what you've done is, is just given a list of, of what these boxes are. Are, are illustrating and we'll just put them into the right boxes and decide how we go. But thank you for your, your input, but you know, if, if we went around everybody and everybody said we'd be here all night. So, but, but yeah. wait till the, the email is, is up and running and then we'll be able to consider. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favour of the recommendation report. Thank you very much, members. Uh, moving on to item 12, the annual review of planning division, uh, decisions. Sorry, Tem Temporal, please. Thank you, Chair. For uh, longer standing members, this should be a more <laughs> traditional report, uh, and it's the annual sort of statistical analysis of how planning has gone over the last year. Um, decisions, this report deals with the decisions that were made during 2018 and 2019. Um, and figures for that year are mainly shown in paragraphs 2.3 and 2.4. There's a lot of numbers in there, and I apologise for that. Again, the longest standing members might remember that um, I compared in words year upon year for the last couple of times I've done this report. I have cut out all that comparison and just put a couple of graphs in. Um, you can see in paragraph 2.5 on what those comparisons look like, and, and the conclusions are really that the committee is, is functioning pretty well. It's, it's concentrating in the main on dealing with major applications, which is what we want to do. Um, it's, um, it's making decisions which are proving to be um, sound, which is good. Um, and the decisions made by officers in the main are found to be sound as well. There is information on appeals in here. There's also information on overturns by committee, so those decisions where officers have recommended maybe refusal, the committee's decided to approve, uh, and decisions where officers have recommended approval and committees have decided to refuse. Um, all the figures are in there, but I'm happy to try and take any questions and answer those. Okay, Councillor Bright. I'm happy to do this, sir, uh, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much, Councillor Donnelly. Councillor, um, who's, who's first? So, Sue Burford. Ladies first. Uh, Sue Burford. Uh, sort of two questions and a comment mixed up, if that's all right. So, really, the first question is um, I see that. 85.71% of major applications are determined by committee. I'm <coughs> curious to know why not the ball. I would have thought all major applications would would deserve going to <coughs> the committee. Um, and then I have, I do have to bring up this old chestnut of 2.12, which I think I've brought up before. Well, I know I've brought it up before. I'm still curious as to know why members have expressed an interest in which parishes have sent applications to planning committee. Um, I trust it's not supposed to be some kind of um, league table. Um, I, for one, as a, as a All Saints Ward member, will uh, continue to send applications to the planning committee if I 
happen to disagree with the recommendation of the planning officer, and that goes both ways. Um, it, in my opinion, it's not just major applications that have consequences. Minor applications also have serious consequences and implications, and if I feel that they need to be in the public forum at a, at a planning committee where both sides, if you like, can, can have their say, um, and everything seems to, seem to be fair, um, then that's what I will continue to do. Tim, do you want to answer that? Um, why not all major applications, first of all? The answer to that is there are some things which are technically major applications, like a variation to a major application that's already been approved. Perhaps as a major, that doesn't really warrant into time thinking about that. In terms of the, uh, the table rather than the table at that 2.12, I'm of course a servant to members in this respect and provide the figures as requested. Um, they're, they're, just, they're just there as a statement of fact. There's no suggestion that anybody behaving badly or behaving worse than anybody else. They're there for consideration. And yes, you're quite right now, so there's no reason why my application can't go before committee appropriate. Councillor Pauly. Um, I'm not sure if you're going to answer that question, but I'm going to answer it. Thank you. Councillor Archer. Uh, yeah, my question also is about table 2.12, so it has been answered, although just at the point the table is going to be there, would it be also good to express those figures as percentages of total applications as well? Because obviously I would imagine some um, wards and areas have a lot more in, in, in terms of just pure number than others, so would a percentage be there also be useful if those figures are deemed to be relevant to us all? I, I can certainly look at providing that, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Slack. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my first question is in, it's a simple question really, in regards to dwelling extensions, uh, are they classed as uh, minor or other step extensions? Yeah. They'll be minors, Chair. They're minors, right. Uh, my old questions are, now we find we have uh, around 82% of minor applications being made delegated decisions with ward members and officers recommendations. And if, if and in most cases they are straightforward to, for approval or refusal, that's fine. But at worst with Ward, I, I do go around and look at applications. I must uh, stress completely on my own. <laughs> I, fi I find, in my opinion, some in my opinion, that site visits are needed so members of the planning committee can view and make a better decision. So I do so very, a few times ask for site visits and. Uh, the application to go to committee so um, it is good if uh, you feel that um, this needs a site visit and it should go to committee so members shouldn't be put off by continuously delegating thank you that's one question chair but as works of ward member i do go and have a look uh, i've already gone over yeah. that sorry okay. Is that's there it, that's it. Is there another? Great. Right. No, Tim. that's it. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, to, to just say, Councillor Slack, your officers think it's entirely laudable that members go and look at applications. Yeah. They think that's really good. Yeah. Uh, and we also take account of requests for site visits for committee as well. Yeah. Um, those are always discussed at the, the, the pre agenda meeting with, with the Chair of the Planning Committee, and we, we come to an agreement about where site visits should be undertaken. Um, so, no problem with that, and no problem with members bringing, um, bringing applications forward for committee. If you, I mean, to just put table 2.12 in, into perspective, if you look at the overall number of miners there, it's not a huge number. No, no. Um, so, so we're not particularly complaining about that. It's just, just there for information, really. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Councillor Hobson. Uh, Chair, I'd like to thank Tim for an excellent report and for answering questions for the members this evening. Uh, we've got a duty to reinforce public confidence in our planning system, and I think it's an excellent report. Thank you. Councillor Martin Burford, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, I applaud that most of the reports, but um, my question is to do with uh, enforcement, or the lack of it, really, and it's probably Tim Brown might have guessed. Um, in my experience, there's no guarantee that any developments are built in accordance with approved plans and stringent conditions, which members very often, in the 50-50 situation at planning committee, vote in favour of on the basis of these stringent conditions. And um, if, they, if then the developer uh, seeks to negotiate with the planning officers changing those conditions, then obviously the effect of that development is watered down. And uh, of course members then see, or members of the public more like, see that the development's not constructed in accordance with those plans. So I have only limited confidence in the ability of the planning department to, to properly perform its duties 
Uh, and that's probably, I suspect, mainly because of short staffing, because we only have one half-time enforcement officer, so the planning case workers are expected to carry out their own enforcement, which uh, very often is, is uh, promoted by either ward members or other councillors or by uh, neighbours of the, of the approved sites where the development's not going quite in accordance with the plans. Uh, so uh, we also, I think, have a lack, I know it's a funding issue, but we have a lack of technical staff as well. So it's uh, staff uh, able to respond to uh, uh, issues about uh, construction. I know it's obviously sometimes a building control often uh, aspect, but there's drainage, um, there are drainage implications as well, which I don't think we have the staff to quite understand. Uh, so that causes quite a few problems, especially on the sites that I'm familiar with in the Mattel area. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Yeah. I must correct Councillor Murphy there on one, one aspect, actually, which we do have one and a half planning enforcement officers. Yeah. Uh, so so we, we did recruit. As you, you might remember, Councillor Murphy, we had a vacancy. We did recruit to that. The guy we recruited is six foot seven and weighs 20 stone, so it can be very handy. <laughs> um, um, so, so we are up to establishment in terms of enforcement. Um, as as Councillor Burford says, um, you know, not all changes to planning schemes not all um, changes are, uh, result in enforcement action, but where it's considered appropriate to do so, enforcement action is taken. We are in court very shortly, we were due in court very shortly, it's actually being uh, agreed without the need for officers to attend court in relation to an enforcement case. We do take those, we do give updates on enforcement at planning committee, uh, and of course we will respond to any individual queries that members have about particular cases, and, 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 and as some members know, we're meeting with residents in one particular case to try and try and talk those through. So we, we do try and do our best with that, but, uh, but there is a, a question of what's in the public interest when we're considering enforcement as well. Councillor Hughes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question's about uh, the reporting of enforcement cases. And uh, the, I, was, I was talking to uh, John Bradbury about the report that goes to the planning committee associated with, with enforcement. Um, and he said to me that it was probably not up to date. And I think from seeing the emails that have passed between Tim Rod and uh, Martin Burford, I think uh, it would indicate that that report isn't up to date. Uh, I'd be grateful. I think that could could effort be made to bring that report, the report that goes to planning committee on enforcement, up to date, because I think it would save some embarrassment on behalf of councillors. And in uh, in regard to this report, uh, the one before us, um, there's no there's no uh, section on enforcement. Um, I feel that it would be useful to have such a section so that we understand, as a, as a whole council, what the council's performance on enforcement. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Two, two things on that. Um, yes, Councillor Hughes, of course, I'll, I'll have a look at that report. I'll talk to John about it and see what we can do on that. I wasn't aware of that, so we'll see what we can do. Uh, in relation to this report, this is a report specifically intended to look at the performance of the planning committee, which is not related really to enforcement, but I take your point. Um, we see what we can do in relation to the report that comes before planning committee about enforcement. I think that might be the best way. Uh, members have got nobody else on my list. It's been moved and seconded for approval. All those in favour, please share. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, we now move to item 13, the review of polling districts, places and stations 2019. <coughs> uh, Sandra, please. Thank you, Chairman. So this is the second report to council on what is a, a mandatory review of uh, our polling scheme. The first stage was led by the local authority and we consulted widely on our current polling scheme and the comments received are set out in an appendix to the report. The second stage requires me wearing a hat as the returning officer to give my comments on that and also any recommendations that I would look forward to to make the voter experience a better one. And thank you to various ward members who have helped me during this review in identifying venues which I may not have been otherwise been aware of. So my recommendations are set out into the, in the report at 4.2. Um, just quickly run through those. Um, the Ashbourne Porter Cabin on Shawcroft Car Park, that serves the Park Estate, which doesn't have any community venue within its own area. We use the Porter Cabin in Shawcroft. Um, it, it suffers from environmental conditions, it's either too hot, too cold, or too moist inside to put up any any kind of information for electors. I've been looking at Ashbourne Library, and that would be a dual-use facility, where I think there might be an added benefit. I would seek to keep the library open so that visitors could come and see their local library uh, during the hours of poll. I've seen it work elsewhere, 
And at the moment, I'm hoping to have an amicable solution to that one, where by Derbyshire County Council will actually agree to enable us to use this. But the bottom line is that I do have powers to second public buildings paid for out of the public purse for polling purposes if necessary. I hope we don't have to resort to that, but my personal view is that this would afford the electors of that area a better experience on polling day. Cressbrook Club, um, thank you to the, the ward member for suggesting an alternative. It is better, and I know informally that the two entities are quite happy with this if it was to go forward. Cromford Institute, um, I've yet to get a site visit um, to, to make absolutely clear that the um, Cromford Community Centre would be better, but I'm, I'm reasonably happy to make that recommendation at this stage. Kerber, we do have access problems there, and that's my major theme this time, trying to eliminate any possibility of people being treated diff differently in a polling station. So my recommendation there is to delete the polling station in Kerber <coughs> and to redirect electors to Carver. Uh, just to let you know that all electors are entitled to a postal vote. There's no qualifying criteria at all. Ian, again, thank you to the ward member. Um, Ian Church Hall is now proposed as a suitable alternative to the Ian Mechanics Institute, which sadly didn't have access for disabled. Great Hooklow um, serves a number of wards and there's a high risk of non-availability here and it's not in public purse hands so there's no way of actually seconding that so trying to mitigate risk in the event of a snap election uh, looking um, as an alternative there. Mappleton, um, we've tried several times to find another alternative in that vicinity. Uh, sadly there isn't one. Um, Mappleton Pavilion is a temporary building in the middle of a sports field and when the weather is good it's almost bearable however it is not accessible to disabled uh, voters and there is a known demand in that area and there's no way that we can provide any temporary ramp arrangements so I see this as the only way out to uh, move electors to Thorpe and Sheldon is down to the high cost per elector ratio where you'll see in the table all elections are funded out of the public purse and I think there is a suitable alternative there by redirecting those electors to an alternative venue. The next stage will, oh sorry, Ashbourne Hilltop. This was a comment that came through from the public consultation and it's one of those areas where we have a polling district boundary which is a wiggly line on a map and now we have a housing development that deals with right angles and it just makes sense to redraw the boundary to accommodate um, new development on the ground. There's no change to the ward boundaries. It's just to make it more convenient for the electors living in that particular area. So the next stage of the review will be for my comments to go out for consultation and then the council will make a decision in November. <coughs> if there is a snap election called before the conclusion of this piece of work, I would look to consult with ward members to bring those alternative facilities into use as soon as practicable. Otherwise, um, the rest will wait until formal confirmation in November. Can, to answer questions. Councillor Simple. Yes, thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, uh, Sandra's given us a very full report already into what she's already done, and and with that, I do feel that uh, we should accept this report, uh, let it go on to public consultation for what's already been proposed within it. And obviously, if there are any other ideas, then I'm sure she'll be open for listening to these through this consultation period. So I propose that we take the recommendations. Councillor Finesse. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'm happy to second it. We have to get these arrangements in place. There may be an election quite soon. Um, uh, I, I was just concerned about one. I was surprised that uh, ENSA um, is still being kept open. It's very expensive. Basic cost of weeks, 470. And quite quite hefty on the cost per voter on a 42 percent uh, turnout. Um, I mean, it's only they could vote at Pillsley, which is only about three miles away, and there was an hourly bus service, so it shouldn't be too inconvenient. Um, there is also, I mean, if you compare that with uh, Sheldon, where people have been asked to go down to Ashford, um, you know, is, is a fair distance. It's probably similar. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sort of being picky on this one, but I, I would like you to have a look at that one again. Yes, Hobson. Thank you, Chair. I've already made an initial comment for this report in respect of Chatsworth Ward, and I look forward to a further period of consultation and uh, hear what uh, other people have got to say. Councillor Archer. 
Thank you, Jenny. Just to clarify the um, the point on the Hilltop, um, Ashbourne Hilltop School and Lower Pingle Road, just the comments on page 25 on that in um, point 32 of the table, it just says no change proposed. Uh, obviously, the, the report we just heard suggested that that change was sort of acceptable, then it said there no change proposed. I do note it goes on to say recommended it needs to go to community governance review. Can I just get absolute clarity on that, that is that change likely to, to happen? Is that definitely going to happen or are we not sure yet until it goes to, to that review? I think the mistake is saying no change proposed. I have, when I looked at the map, it was a, a really obvious thing that we could do. So it is part of the proposals to redraw the line. Okay. I've got nobody else on the table. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favour, please show. Thank you very much. That's unanimous. Um, that's passed. Uh, item 14, Treasury Management Annual Report. Mark, please. Mark Nash. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is a Treasury Management Report for 2018-19, <coughs> which details our performance from Treasury activity. Um, as we go through the report, it does show our level of borrowing and investments at the year end, um, our need to borrow, uh, the returns that we've made from our Treasury activity during the year, which you'll probably see are quite modest, but as the report says that our primary activity with our Treasury functions is concerning security and liquidity for the Council rather than speculative investments to make return. Um, and the final part of the report is the compliance side of the report of how we have conducted the Treasury activity during the year, ensuring that we have um, stayed within the prudential limits and controls that members have set for us at the outset of the year, uh, and obviously all of those have been complied with during the year. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Chair. I'm satisfied with the content of the report and the way that members are invested, so I will report. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, uh, Sue Hobson. Chair, I'd like to thank Mark for his report and I'm happy to second. Okay, good. Councillor Ratcliffe. Thank you, Chair. Just a question to you, Mark, if I may. Uh, I couldn't help but notice in your table 1.6 of investments that we have some substantial holdings in three borough district councils. Uh, and of course, the question arose in my mind, what is it particularly that is of benefit in investing in those councils? And just coming back to what we always, uh, uh, I think, bear in mind over our investments is, do we scrutinise them for ethical activity? Well, in terms of the investments in the um, other authorities, they uh, they represent short-term loans that we've given to those mm -hmm. to other authorities. Yeah, for their short-term cash purposes, well, we have surplus. Um, in terms of the scrutiny of those investments, we scrutinise them um, on their security uh, and on advice from all in close our treasury. Are, are we allowed to know what they're using our money for? Um, it, that's not an inquiry that we make on our, on our uh, loans that we make out to local authorities, no. Okay, I wouldn't like to think that, that we're doing something that is... Can, can we have the mic on? Oh. Mike, we have the mic on. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Chair. I, I wouldn't like to think that, that, that we're doing something that is against our um, stance on various things. Well, as, as a local authority, they will be constrained by the same by themselves. statutory yeah, regulations yeah. Okay. That, that we are. Um, but as part of a government and a public body, they are seen as um, extremely safe, more safe than um, private sector investments. And so we, yeah. we readily do invest in other, yeah. other local authorities. Anyway, thank you for your report, Mark. Mark, very good. Councillor Slack. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, looking at the same one, Mark, uh, 1.6. Uh, who were our CCLA property fund? I'm noticing minus 2.71. The CCA property fund is, uh, is, a, 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 is effectively a, a charity property fund that's set up. Now, the, the negative return um, is because <coughs> effectively when we invested in the property fund, it's like buying shares. Yeah. Um, and the bid price that we pay to purchase the shares <coughs> is more than the amount that we would be able to resell those shares if we were to be able to sell them straight away. Yeah. So it's a known and expected loss when you are looking at long-term investments like this, but it yeah. does make 
the actual revenue return that it makes on an annual basis is, is more like 4%. So um, yeah. we consider this to be um, a, 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 an amount of financing that we can put out long term and not have to draw back. Yeah. Uh, and over the, the life, over the three to five years that we would expect to have it there, it will more than make back the initial Great. loss on the purchase. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. I've got nobody else uh, on my list now. It's been moved and seconded for approval. All those in favour, please share. Thank you very much. Move on now to the Kirk Ides and Neighbourhood Plan, item 15, my case, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, the report that you have before you is a fairly self explanatory report. The Kirk Ides and um, Neighbourhood Plan has been in preparation for a number of years now. It's now reached the formal consultation stage, and uh, from Monday that period started, and we'll, we'll run through for a period of six weeks until the 4th of. November. Um, we are a consultee on that um, and what we set out in the report is an <coughs> officer comments in relation to the contents of the draft plan the members accept those they will then go on to the independent examiner Mr Madison who will then review those alongside any other comments that <coughs> we receive from residents, businesses or statutory consultees and an uh, independent examination which is likely to take place um, I'm written representation that I would suspect in November um, and I'll be involved in the Monster referendum later on next year. Councillor Gray. Thank you Chair. Um, as a ward member I'm quite happy to uh, recommend this for approval. Um, they've worked very hard on this so you know, I hope it, hope it goes through without any problems. So thank you. Councillor Finesse. Yeah, thank you. Thank you Chair. I'm very happy to, to uh, second this. Um, and uh, speed it on its way to you know the next part of the process. I look forward to it coming back to CNA committee in due course, as it yes, says here. Yes, I mean, these neighbourhood plans are so important. I mean, we're, we're Bradwell, and know works with the pound the same. They are very, very beneficial to the community. And I, I hope also that officers will encourage them also to look at a community land trust, which I'm sure Councillor Ratcliffe and will echo my thoughts, yeah. you know, that they are very important and very helpful in making good use of the neighbourhood. Thank you, Councillor Ratcliffe. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I am pleased to, to note that uh, yet another community initiative is coming to fruition, and Kirk Hyden, at some point in the not too distant future, uh, hopefully, will have its uh, neighbourhood plan in force. Uh, I have to note, though, and perhaps just to feed back to my case, so I know as uh, been looking at this very closely and has made a, a number of comments of, of amendments uh, and I have to say I do agree uh, with him having gone through this process with works with myself uh, that he's quite correct in uh, pointing out policies in Kirk Harrison's plan that are already present in the local plan uh, or indeed are, are uh, counter um, uh, are going against uh, that local plan uh, but I have spoken incidentally to the chair of this uh, plan group and I understand it what they would like to see happen is for the independent examiner to make his recommendations before any changes are made by the Kirk Ayrton group. Now I don't know if that's against your your protocol, um, I, I, I couldn't uh, say, but uh, I know that to be uh, the, their wishes. Um, other than that, uh, I, I would just make a personal comment that I have done before, is that, um, the, the, the 2011 Localism Act was intended to give power to communities a move from top down to bottom up as it were and there is a danger of uh, divorcing ourselves from what the public would like, what our communities would wish for uh, and what it is that uh, perhaps we on the council uh, would think is in our interest either operationally or indeed financially um, 
neighborhood plans are a good and important element in the planning um, documentation, but they're no way as strong as the, they were intended. Uh, but I do congratulate Kurt I and I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very good um, consultation that's taken place uh, and uh, there is a lot there that it perhaps just um, tweaked and um, tightened up I think will prove of great value to this um, Dalshi Dales uh, uh, village and small community. Mike, do you want to say something? Yeah, thanks, Jay. In terms of the comment Council Rack has made in relation to what Kirk has said, um, the, the process is, is that they have prepared a, a draft plan that is now subject to consultation. We, as I say, are consulted. We, have, we will make our, our comments known, assuming they are approved this evening, to the independent examiner. The independent examiner will scrutinise our comments the neighbourhood plan group will also be able to make their own comments yeah. known to the independent examiner during the examination process yeah. and the examiner will then come to a view as to what he thinks taking into account government guidance, statutory legislation, the contents of our local plan, national planning policy framework and other factors that might influence that decision making process what are appropriate formal words to go into the neighbourhood the neighbor plan and that will then form the basis of his recommendation. <coughs> Members will see his recommendation uh, either here or community environment committee in the future because then at that particular point the council will then have to sign it off before going to referendum. I don't anticipate in this particular neighbourhood plan there being any particular issues other than as with others, uh, minor fine tuning of the wording to make sure that they dovetail together their policies with our, our local yeah. policies. Can you could just confirm though, Mike, in case they are watching or listening, that they don't have to make these changes prior to it, <coughs> its submission to the examiner? That's absolutely the case. Yeah, well, that's fine. Thank you. They've turned off Coronation Street in Kirk Arson to watch us tonight, apparently. Yeah. That's what I hear. Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes there's more excitement here, isn't there? <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, Councillor Margie Burford. Thank you, Chair. I think my question's been largely answered because I was going to endorse what, I uh, well, can endorse now what Councillor <coughs> has just said. And uh, certainly, uh, Lord Rogers says about naval plans being basically bottom up rather than top down. Uh, but I, noted, I did notice when I looked at this report that the enormous number of comments or critical comments you say about different aspects of the draft plan. So are they typical uh, all neighbourhood plans which uh, it quite looks at from time to time, obviously on a quite fairly regular basis? And um, uh, do they do parishes producing these plans normally amend them quite drastically in accordance with his comments or do they leave them generally for the inspector to adjudicate on them? I mean, it, it seems quite strange to a small village uh, action group to look at these things. I mean, you look at it, it could be quite daunting to go through this and think, oh, we've got to change that, and oh, we, do we agree with this? And it could go on forever trying to uh, dis decipher it and also decide what, how to react and how to um, amend the plan uh, to make it more acceptable to this council and presumably to the examiner as well. Hi. I'll try to be as brief as I can. Um, Councillor Brackliffe alluded to that sort of potential conflict, if you like, between the, the desire of a local community to, to sort of set the, the ball, set the, the set the parameters for what they want to see within their community against what the statutory requirements are, which is to be in conformity with national and local strategic policy. <coughs> so typically what we find when we're going through the plans is that there is an aspiration for X and that doesn't comply or either doesn't comply, is in contrary to, or is actually duplicating what's in the local plan. So what we're trying to do in the, the guidance we give to the, the community is to try and make sure that they understand what they have got to do in terms of the statutory duty in relation to conformity <coughs> and compliance with, with local and national policy. That's not to say that their plan can't move forward 
with those conflicts within them because there are conflicts in all of the plans that we've put forward that have been conflicts and they, they will be the same in the future. And, and that's what <coughs> the examination process allows people to do, is to have that opportunity for debate, for one side of the fence to be looked at, for another side of the fence to be looked at. And the, the independent examiner that we have been using, in, this will be now the third examination, is very good at reconciling those differences and being in a situation, being in a position where you can say, I understand where Derbyshire Dales are coming from, I understand where the community is coming from, with a bit of tweaking, those two can dovetail together very easily and comply with legislation. Thank you very much. Got nobody else on my list. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favour, please show. Sixteen, the referred items, uh, to consider two recommendations for funding from the Government Resources Committee. Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Chair. Well, Councillor Chris Pennis and myself are on this joint committee and at the Bolsover District Council meeting uh, when this was uh, on the agenda at Clown. Uh, we gave it a thorough examination uh, and lots of questions to officers. So I'm satisfied with the recommendations and I think it's important that uh, we make our contribution with the other uh, constituent members of the Joint Council uh, ICT Committee, so I'm all Councillor Finesse? Yes, I'm happy to second it. Um, Councillor Hughes also is on this committee, and uh, I'm currently vice chair at the moment. And as, as, uh, as uh, Councillor Purdy said, we have had some heated debates there, particularly over a redundancy issue, which is costing the Joint Committee about £90,000. But we, it was proved to us that uh, over the course of four years, that money will come back because the new person that's going to go in there to replace the redundant person will have special skills which are needed, you know, to, to drive this uh, this joint committee forward. So we're very happy to <laughs> second the uh, recommendation. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favour, please show. Unanimous. Um, even though we have nobody else in the room, we do have to exclude the public and press formally. Uh, do you so move, Councillor Donnelly? Uh, do you second Councillor Bright? <coughs> Thank you. All those in favour, please show.